I have focused on trying to understand the aging female brain because understanding that, that brain and its aging process will provide insights into why the brain develops Alzheimer's disease. And what we have found is that studying the female brain has given us the opportunity to ask the same questions of the male brain, which I can discuss later. And it turns out they're different. So let's start first with asking, what does aging look like? And typically, we think of aging as a linear process that we start out alive and we end up dead. What our work has shown is that aging is actually a series of transition states. And it's those transition states that I'll be talking more about today. So let's think a little bit about transition states. Transition states can span years, otherwise known as a prodromal phase. The pre-disease transition state is at the border of normality. And that small perturbations can unmask those existing vulnerabilities to create a critical slowing of the system. The transition state is unstable and potentially reversible. There's a sequential activation and deactivation of regulatory pathways shown here in a systems biology schematic that the aging brain is in fact quite complex and quite dynamic. It is not the same throughout. These transition states are time limited. These are complex systems that have critical thresholds or tipping points. The other kind of review I wanna make sure we go over is the bioenergetic requirements of the brain. It's that bioenergetic requirement that makes the brain a powerhouse versus a power failure. The brain weighs 2% of total body weight, yet consumes 20% of the total oxygen and 25% of the total, total glucose. The brain is in many respects a single fuel organ and that fuel is glucose. 75% of ATP that is generated from glucose metabolism in the brain is consumed by neurons to restore the membrane potential. Now that's critical because that restoration of membrane potential by ATP dependent transport mechanisms is critical for the firing uh, of excitatory and inhibitory synaptic potentials in rapid progression. 80% of ATP is generated by oxidative phosphorylation in neuronal mitochondria. Now again, coming back to this ATP issue, the smallest decrement in ATP is actually going to be manifested in those circuits, in those neurons that have the highest energetic demand. And those neurons are the ones that we're using right now for rapid information processing, rapid information retrieval, and the generation of new neural circuits to store that information. Decline in brain glucose metabolism is evident in the preclinical phase of Alzheimer's disease and throughout the disease. It's evident in high-risk APOE4 population and evident in both familial and late-onset Alzheimer's disease. Our work has focused for many years on the mechanisms of estrogen action in the brain because of the loss of estrogen during a midlife endocrine transition of the perimenopause and menopause. And what our work has shown over many years is that estrogen, I call the queen of Darwin, it, it has left nothing to chance when it comes to glucose metabolism in the brain. It promotes glucose uptake, its metabolism, the TCA cycle, and ultimately conversion of the TCA metabolites into ATP. What we find is that during the perimenopause, the loss of estrogen, the decline in brain estrogen, leads to the activation of a starvation response, the utilization of ketone bodies. 
for a, as an auxiliary fuel to generate acetyl-CoA, which can ultimately be converted into ATP. Estrogen actually suppresses this system, but the loss of estrogen act, allows this system to be expressed, and particularly that the enzyme responsible for metabolism of ketone bodies, the Scott enzyme. The problem is, is that this starvation response is meant to be short-lived. Regrettably, the decline in estrogen can be, without hormone therapy, extend for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. That utilization of ketone bodies as an auxiliary fuel we have found puts the white matter of the brain at risk because the white matter can be a source of lipids and fatty acids that ultimately can be used to generate acetyl-CoA to traverse the CCA cycle and ultimately be converted to ATP. Estrogen, as I mentioned, regulates the entire pathway um, from glucose metabolism to the TCA cycle to mitochondrial generation of ATP. The loss of estrogen puts that system at risk for conversion to an auxiliary fuel system, ketone bodies, and ultimately fatty acids. As I mentioned, those fatty acids can be derived from white matter in the brain, though the brain is actually 60% white matter, which makes it a very rich source and is likely the reason why the brain is dependent upon glucose from the periphery delivered by the vascular system to the brain as its primary fuel. Work done by Lauren Klozinski in my lab as a post, as a uh, graduate student worked through this entire process. And the bottom line is what we found is that the conversion of mitochondria to, from efficient to inefficient is associated with the generation of hydrogen peroxide free radical generation. And it's this generation of hydrogen peroxide that activates a complex biochemical system, the phospholipase A2 and the rocadanic acid system that activates sphingomyelinase to break down myelin uh, into its component lipids, first sphingomyelin to ceramides to fatty acids and ultimately ketone bodies. And this is conducted um, in the glial cells that then utilize ketone, can generate these ketone bodies to then feed to neurons as acetyl-CoA to generate a, uh, ATP. What does that look like? Here what you see are electron micrographs of uh, white matter, of axonal tracts and white matter in the rodent brain. Uh, here, white matter is quite condensed, um, quite healthy, uh, and electro, uh, electrical um, uh, transmission is quite rapid. During the perimenopause, what we see is an unraveling of that white matter and pulling, distorting the axon because it's, it's connected to the white matter, distorting the morphology of the axon within. And ultimately what we see is the loss of white matter um, density in uh, the postmenopausal animal. And that's shown quantitatively here. What Fei Yin and his group <clears throat> has shown is that indeed these lipids being generated, these lipid droplets being generated by um, the uh, metabolism of white matter as fuel is uh, actually, you can see these red dots here, not in the male, but in the female, you can see in the APOE3 male, female, there is a density of aged female in, of lipid droplets in these astrocytes that is um, quite pronounced in the APOE4 female brain astrocytes. And that's quantitatively shown here. Again, confirming that lipid droplets are being generated and then ultimately being metabolized by the astrocytes in the brain. 
does this have any parallels to the human brain? Um, our mechanistic analyses um, intrigued Lisa Mosconi, our collaborator, and she set out to conduct analyses uh, in a population of women who were uh, premenopausal, perimenopausal, and postmenopausal. Now, what was so important about this collaboration with Dr. Mosconi is that our preclinical discovery science set up the parameters that then Dr. Mosconi followed in her own studies. And what you see here are FDG PET um, uh, images from uh, premenopausal women, uh, pre pre their perimenopausal age, they're not yet perimenopausal. And this is all matched to age-matched males. So in these pre- and perimenopausal women, you see glucose metabolism relative to that age-matched male. And there are some areas showing already some indication of glucose hypermetabolism. That expands a bit in the perimenopause and is quite evident in the postmenopause. And quantitatively, you see the changes here in temporal cortex, precuneus cortex, and frontal cortex. So this is not specific to a single brain region, but actually appears in multiple brain regions critical for cognitive function and affected in Alzheimer's disease. Does that parallel development of a marker of, of Alzheimer's disease, a biomarker of Alzheimer's disease, beta amyloid plaque? And again, you see in the aging pre perimenopausal female, some beta amyloid deposition, which is increased during the perimenopause and uh, again, increased in the postmenopause. And this is all relative to the male at, at comparable ages. And we see again, that men are not generating the beta amyloid as women are. Does this translate into changes in gray and white matter volumes? Again, what we see, A, these are uh, women who are pre-perimenopausal of the same age. Perimenopausal women, we see uh, a slight decline in gray matter, which is consistent with uh, previous reports in uh, early aging and greater gray matter loss in the postmenopausal women. What we really see is the change, the decline in white matter volume, particularly during the perimenopause and postmenopause, consistent with the brain utilizing its own source of lipids as a uh, source of fuel to sustain energetic demand of the brain. So we're, we asked a question whether we could actually use a peripheral biomarker to identify women who were at risk for these uh, changes, these early changes associated with Alzheimer's disease. And in this um, study, we looked at platelet, peripheral platelet mitochondrial complex for activity and indeed found that there are positive correlations between the FDG PET signal and the change in the ability of mitochondria, um, uh, complex four uh, enzyme activity in mitochondria, suggesting that there may indeed be a potential for a peripheral biomarker to identify women at risk for this aging process, at risk for Alzheimer's disease. In what in the, during the course of these analyses, both at our primarily our discovery science and then confirmed in our clinical science analyses, is that we identified that there are actually two aging programs: the early pre-perimenopausal aging, chronological aging, and postmenopausal aging, and that the endocrinological aging is sandwiched between these two chronological aging programs um, that, that essentially are quite unique. This chronological aging is, is susceptible to pre-existing conditions. For example, APOE genotype or other health risk 
uh, pre exist genetic pre dispositions. That sets up the platform under which endocrinological aging program proceeds. And then it's that, essentially that component that then sets up the chronological aging um, trajectory. To give you a sense of what this looks like in combination, what we see here is that for women, um, they have multiple fuel sources that they turn to during this process. So what we see here is in glucose metabolism, as we've shown both in our basic science and clinical science studies, that during the perimenopause, there's a decline in glucose metabolism and a rise in ketone metabolism. In parallel, this is work that we just published in scientific reports, there is a rise in amino acid metabolism. Now, what we don't know, but what concerns me is that those amino acids are actually being generated by degenerating neural circuits. We've yet to test that hypothesis, but this was a surprise to me. In parallel, what we see is that, as in our basic and clinical science, we see the rise of fatty acid beta oxidation, essentially the catabolism of white matter, the fuel. What we're currently exploring is the role of the immune system in this entire process. Again, the decline in glucose metabolism, the rise in fatty acid metabolism is paralleled by, in this, pre, in this early chronological aging, a rise in innate immune responses that then subsides during the perimenopause, but which essentially activates this adaptive immune response that does not abate and that continues. Both the innate now and the adaptive immune systems are activated uh, and functioning in the postmenopausal chronological aging stage. So our current work is trying to understand uh, the, the entire systems of biology that are being activated. I will tell you that what we also see is during the perimenopause, infiltration of peripheral immune cells into the brain um, that are involved in particularly the adaptive immune response. So stay tuned for that. Another question that we have been pursuing is, is it possible to identify women at risk for Alzheimer's disease when they are still healthy? Essentially an attempt to prevent, to identify women who are at risk and for Alzheimer's and then to prevent the progression to disease. And this is work that was done by Jamaica Redberg and colleagues, uh, Wendy Mack and uh, Howard Hodes at USC, in which we did an analysis of the metabolic profiles of women in the elite clinical trial. And outcomes of that research showed that, that in fact, in this cluster of women, about 500 women um, we were able to analyze, there were actually three groups of women. There was, a, there was a group of women who were metabolically healthy, women who were at risk for cardiovascular disease, and women who were at risk for metabolic syndrome. This gets to the question of, can we take our basic and clinical science and now translate this into a clinically deployable opportunity to identify women at risk for Alzheimer's disease? And we used uh, existing clinical uh, metabolic indicators listed here, the HOMA score, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, and blood pressure. And here you see the profiles of these women in each of these clusters. We then asked the question, does this actually predict cognitive function in these women? And what we see here 
is that in global, verbal, and executive function, what we see that healthy women are performing well, women who are at risk for cardiovascular disease and showing higher than uh, would be uh, you know, comfortable with blood pressure, are not performing as well as the healthy women, but not statistically significantly different, suggesting that um, this is a great opportunity to intervene in these women. It was the women who had poor metabolic health, who were at risk for metabolic syndrome, that showed statistically significant decline relative to the healthy women in global, verbal, and executive function. So the question is, is what's the intervention that we can do? And part of what we then asked was, can we further identify these women in the poor metabolic group? And what we found is that the women who were driving this statistically significant difference were in fact women who were ApoE4 positive. That said, it turns out that there were ApoE4, the same ratio of women who were ApoE4 positive in the healthy metabolic group and the women at risk for cardiovascular disease, suggesting that targeting metabolic health, in fact, is critical for sustaining cognitive function and preventing conversion to a, if you will, a and compromised uh, cognitive function, perhaps leading to mild cognitive impairment uh, in later life. So metabolic health indicators uh, can be, uh, coupled with ApoE4 genotype, can be a strategy for identifying at-risk women. So could hormone therapy be beneficial? Um, and this is work done by Yu Jin Kim, a uh, postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory now. And in this study, we analyzed, we started out with a cohort of uh, uh, over a million women um, from a medical claims database, uh, the Humana Medical Claims Database. And this gives you the consort um, diagram. And essentially, what we asked in this uh, propensity matched populations is, is there a difference between women who have been on menopausal hormone therapy, MHT, and their risk for developing multiple age-associated neurodegenerative diseases. And the bottom line is, in this cohort of women, sorry, the figure legend is there, um, that indeed, hormone therapy, this is the control group at one, and hormone therapy indeed reduced the risk of each of these diseases from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, uh, multiple sclerosis, and ALS, suggesting that there is a benefit of hormone therapy to prevent um, later life neurodegenerative diseases. Now, then we began to ask, in a, in a strategy to begin to approach a precision hormone therapy approach, is are there differences in different types of hormone therapies? And indeed there are, um, that uh, essentially what you see here are FDA approved, <clears throat> excuse me, FDA approved hormone therapies, and they do show differences. Uh, and some of which are statistically significant. The only one that didn't show statistical significance in terms of uh, reducing risk of neurodegenerative diseases was estroderm. So already you, many of you will recognize that some of these are oral uh, hormone therapies versus transdermal hormone therapies. So is there a statistically significant difference between any of them? No, there isn't at this point. Um, we are actually uh, now analyzing a data set of 25 million women um, to address that question. But going to the question of, is there a difference between oral versus transdermal um, formulations? We find that the oral formulations, largely because they have been prescribed more frequently, show a consistent effect 
of reducing risk, uh, statistically significant effect in reducing risk of developing multiple age-associated neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's. <clears throat> the transdermal formulations um, show a significant reduction in all forms of um, age-associated neurodegenerative diseases, um, but lose significance when we, get, when we begin to have smaller numbers. So essentially, we're going to have to have a much larger population to address the difference between oral versus transdermal, so that the numbers of women um, are comparable in each group. Does the duration of hormone therapy reduce the risk? Again, for on Alzheimer's disease, what we see is that the longer the, the time on hormone therapy, the greater the reduction in risk. Now, all of this, these kinds of findings actually replicate the very early studies that were done on hormone therapy. Um, so I'm very pleased that we're able to replicate multiple other studies, those done by Victor Henderson and Richard, um, uh, his name will come to me in a moment, um, uh, from the Manhattan cohort, Mayhu, uh, from the Manhattan cohort, um, and others who have done these types of analyses. And when we, again, when we look at the different types of uh, neurodegenerative diseases, we see again that the longer the therapy, the greater the uh, reduction in risk, the greater the long-term use of menopausal hormone therapy. So we'll have to wait on whether um, we can identify optimal and optimal hormone therapy at this point, but encouragingly, all of them show some benefit, significant benefit. Going forward, it's going to be important to actually apply precision medicine um, strategies to this uh, analysis. So what about women who are on anti-hormone therapies who are being treated for breast cancer? And this is a study that we just recently published between uh, investigating the association between these hormone therapy modulating breast cancer therapies and the incidence of neurodegenerative outcomes in women with breast cancer. Now I must tell you that um, my my hypothesis was not confirmed in this study. Again, we started out with a very large cohort, um, over 300,000 women, um, who then were uh, propensity score matched for um, morbidity uh, indicators, and, uh, and then had uh, a, a subsequent analysis of around 20,000 women. And the outcomes of this study, which was initially surprising to me, um, but which were consistent with at least some of our early uh, in vitro discovery analyses, showing that women who were on aromatase inhibitors or tamoxifen had a significant reduction in risk across multiple neurodegenerative diseases. Those who were on raloxifen showed no difference in um, risk of developing uh, these diseases, suggesting that the mechanisms or either the mechanisms or the availability of raloxifen into the brain may be a modulating factor. Now, I will tell you that something that was quite interesting to me is that many women, uh, when they learned that I, uh, research, investigate estrogen action in the brain will instantaneously tell me about their experience of a breast cancer hormone therapy, um, uh, anti-hormone therapy regimen. And typically that is a adverse effect and they will often complain, often complain about uh, brain fog, um, severe memory loss and the most severe cognitive um, complaints that has been told to me anecdotally is actually uh, women who were on the aromatase inhibitors. So I was quite surprised at this. Um, so clearly, uh, there's a lot more work that needs to be done to identify women who are appropriate for aromatase inhibitors 
versus tamoxifen, if you will. These drugs have an equal effect on preventing recurrence of breast cancer. So in the breast, they are essentially equally efficacious, um, whereas in brain, that does not appear to be the case. But we do have to know far more about why is it that some women will experience quite dramatic uh, deficits in cognitive function versus uh, these data showing a um, beneficial effect on preventing age-associated neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's. So again, we're gonna be following up um, this study, uh, these results in the um, 25 million women um, data set. So when we, because of my uh, kind of anecdotal experience, we began to look at, well, what's the difference between aromatase inhibitors? Well, one is steroidal and another is non-steroidal. And what we find is that even though the non-steroidal is beneficial, it's not as beneficial um, as the steroidal um, aromatase inhibitor. Uh, and we're now doing computational chemistry analyses to understand better how these molecules are interacting with the estrogen receptor, particularly these steroidal aromatase inhibitors. So stay tuned on that. So when we looked at the uh, long-term use of these um, um, hormone modulating therapies for breast cancer, and we look at um, all combined, we see a relatively, it's statistically significant, but a relatively um, shallow difference in the effect of these breast cancer therapies on risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. However, when we break this data down into age groups, what we see is that the women who are benefiting the most from this prior exposure to a uh, hormone modulating therapy for breast cancer are actually experiencing the greatest benefit, um, suggesting that uh, delaying the uh, impact of uh, loss of estrogen in brain, because we know, for example, that tamoxifen can act as an estrogen agonist in brain, as well as other compounds not currently used, but were in, uh, used early on for breast cancer, that these breast cancer therapies can actually be estrogen agonist in brain. We found that for tamoxifen, we found that for raloxifen. Okay, so essentially, again, what we see is that the longer an individual is on this, horn, on this therapy, uh, and the older they get, the greater the benefit um, for reducing risk. So to conclude, the path to hormone therapy to prevent and delay Alzheimer's disease, it is not appropriate for treatment, but to prevent and delay, is really reliant on our knowledge of the system's biology. This bioenergetic crisis early in brain is an early indicator of AD risk, and there are sex differences. It appears early in aging, and this perimenopausal transition unmasks risk. Um, and the genetic risk factor, like APOE, is manifested on a system's biology determined by sex. So these two early genetic components, both the genetic risk factor, in this case APOE4, uh, and sex biology, determine the trajectory of aging and ultimately the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. The bioenergetic response involves both nuclear and mitochondrial genomes, which is a work that is in progress at this point, but is important when we think about you know, therapeutic uh, approaches for the prevention and delay of Alzheimer's disease. It's not just one genome that is being impacted. What we find is that this transition state is associated with activation of a, starving, a, a starvation response, to generate auxiliary fuels, and that the lipid biology of the female likely puts her white matter at risk for the generation of ketone bodies, and the loss of estrogen in particular um, is a driving force. We can prevent the um, metabolism, catabolism of white matter in 
animals that are treated with estrogen therapy um, early in the aging process or in the ovarectomized mouse. What we find is that the protein biology of the male puts their muscle at risk and control of that muscle um, at risk for the generation to utilize muscle for generation of glucose and ketone bodies. In translational models of human disease, chromosomal sex matters. They are going to, if even though the hallmark pathologies of the disease are comparable, the response to that stressor is going to be dependent upon the chromosomal sex biology. And that the validity of our model systems do require assessment in both sexes. The assessment uh, of precision hormone therapy is going to, again, require the assessment of both chromosomal sex and APOE genotype. In the data that I showed you, we know the chromosomal sex, they're female. What we don't know is their APOE genotype. And so again, this is an area of exploration for us. We will need therapeutics that are systems biology therapeutics of which estrogen and progesterone are systems biology regulators. And lastly, it's clear that we are very close to essentially achieving precision hormone therapy. We have the data. The data is out there on both women who are using hormone therapies and women who are not. And we can now interrogate data sets with their genotypes. So this vision is achievable. And I anticipate that within five years, we will certainly be able to deliver precision hormone therapy. And with that, I will thank you and uh, take questions. Thank you so much for an amazing talk. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I, I will open up for questions now um, and please feel free to put into the chat or uh, uh, considering there's a, there is a healthy sized group here though. So I, you know, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask a question, feel free. Um, but the chat is probably a little bit easier for me to, to deal with. But um, one question I wanted to ask, uh, uh, just to take over for a second, is um, so you, you gave some really interesting data about different um, sort of the length of uh, duration of taking these, um, you know, uh, hormos, hormone therapies and things. But one question that I've often had on my mind, and it sort of spawns from the elite trial, is about whether or not... Uh, uh, the 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 time at which you start the hormone therapy the the age at which or maybe during the the chronicity of menopause is it during menopause or post menopause it didn't seem like the elite trial said anything about that but some some of the the thoughts about the women's health um uh uh trial was about um the the idea of of maybe you had been taking the hormone therapy a little bit late um, and that's why maybe there was um, some thought that there was less um, beneficial component to it. And I just wanted to know what, what your thoughts might be or whether the data had suggested anything in, in your analyses. So, the, so you're, you're definitely on target, Rachel. So essentially, even though my colleagues don't like it when I say this, the elite trial was hormone therapy late or later. None of the, all the women were postmenopausal none of the women were having hot flashes. And that was the same with the Women's Health Initiative study. So what our work shows is that the system is changing. Um, perimenopause is like puberty, right? You go in one way and it takes a year, two years, a little bit longer, and then you come out and you're different, right? And um, that's the same for perimenopause as it is for puberty. So in the case of the elite trial, it was women who, who were six to 10 years, six to nine years following menopause versus 10 plus years following menopause. So these women were already postmenopausal. And so intervening at that point, um, the, the system has changed. It's, it's a different system. 
uh, and it's not an estrogen responsive system. That said, very small numbers, not published data. What we found is that the women who showed benefit of estrogen therapy, in this case it was estrogen uh, therapy, um, were the women who were in the metabolic, metabolic syndrome at risk group, that those women actually showed improvement in some of their clinical measures. So there is a cohort of women who are still responsive and um, I'm not clear I know why that is, but it was a surprising observation and it's, you know, it's an observation at this point. What I'll say is that coming back to your kind of uh, fundamental question, around timing of in, in initiating hormone therapy and estrogen therapy is estrogen does not impact chronological aging. It impacts the endocrinological aging. And what we find is that it delays and maybe prevents, well, it's not really preventing because there's still, you know, you still reach menopause. But it's delaying many of the aspects of endocrinological aging. And that turns out to be key because it's that endocrinological aging that sets the stage for the, third, the second chronological aging program to act on. So that's why intervening at the time that women have symptoms um, is critical, not when their symptoms have abated, because their symptoms are symptoms of the neurological system changing. It's a wonderful answer. I, I very much appreciate that. And actually it was a, a question from somebody else in the audience as well. So thank you so much for answering that. Um, another question was um, about the rodent myelin pictures. They were quite striking. Has anything similar been described for human pathology specimens? So that's a great question. We actually are um, working now, and in fact, some of it's coming from the Harvard Brain Bank. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting uh, electron micrographs um, for just this type of analysis from, uh, from multiple brain banks uh, through the NIA, one of them being the Harvard Brain Bank, uh, to ask this, this exact same question. We see that there is a decline in white matter volume and then the question becomes, what about in the integrity? Can that also, sorry, it's Charles, I was the one who asked that question. Can that also be looked at using uh, diffusion imaging? You can look at uh, myelin compaction these days with diffusion methods. In yeah, so we are. Um, actually, this is work we're doing with um, Lisa Mosconi, um, looking at these uh, diffusion imaging, you know, radial and axial um, diffusion for, uh, in these brains. Um, it does require a different sequence. Some of the brains, the brains that the images that we have collected in the past um, five years have been um, using the DTI uh, imaging sequence. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Um, another question actually from Cindy is saying, thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, do you think that systemic changes in metabolism also contribute to CNS metabolic changes? And do you think this is different between women and men? So to, to answer the first question, something that was really surprising, and we just, we just published this in uh, scientific reports, is it's so interesting that there's this, there's this, activation and deactivation of communication between the peripheral metabolic system and the brain metabolic system. And it turns out that the brain uh, communicates quite significantly when it's under stress. Most of the time it's running on its own program, right? But under stress, it kind of opens up and now the peripheral immune system and the brain, I mean, uh, the peripheral metabolic system and the brain metabolic system are in sync. And you can see that um, both in terms of the uh, metabolic uh, profile in brain and the metabolic profile in plasma. So then the question becomes, well, what about, you know, type two diabetes? I think something that has, um, I have been uh, quite, impressed by is that 
the first organ to be affected in type 2 diabetes, we always think of, you know, type 2 diabetes from the neck down. The first organ to be affected is actually the brain. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, I know, the, initially there are subtle changes because there's this um, reprogramming, cellular and systems level reprogramming to utilize auxiliary fuels um, for uh, in type 2 diabetes. Um, and that, that is quite concerning, obviously, for, for later life cognitive function. Uh, I think in, even though in younger individuals, children, type 2 diabetes is, is uh, quite distressing, there are resiliency systems that are sustainable, that are lost um, during the aging process. So the answer, the short answer is yes and yes. <laughs> That's great. And actually, somebody had asked a similar question, and I think you've touched on that, is uh, the earlier onset of obesity, for example, would that make one more vulnerable um, uh, to these uh, sort of uh, metabolic issues, um, CNS-related? One, one uh, kind of caveat to all of that that I'd like to add is that um, it's an interesting, two interesting observations. One is that weight gain before 65, and that's kind of an artificial cutoff, but weight gain before 65 is associated with higher risk of Alzheimer's. Weight gain after 65 is associated with a lower risk of Alzheimer's. And why would that be? Well, 10 years prior to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, there's an inexplicable weight loss. But what that really means is that peripheral stores of fuel are being utilized. Yeah, yeah, very good point to raise. Um, uh, Hadeen would like to say thank you very much for the great talk. Um, and I just lost her question. In the breast cancer studies, given the low proportion on adherence to um, tamo tamoxifen, I believe it is, and, um, and aromatase inhibitors, do you think that the benefits are drug specific effects or related to adherence? And actually, that was a question I had as well. They're related to adherence. Um, you know, in, in the Humana data set that we utilize to begin with, um, our uh, clinical colleague, Dr. Uh, Lee Neumeyer, um, was picked that up right away. Wait a minute, you have a high number of women who are not compliant. And she sees that in her clinical practice. And it's there are two reasons. One is that, um, that women have this uh, network of women that say, I felt terrible on tamoxifen or the aromatase inhibitors, um, uh, so I don't take it. Um, then there is, uh, you know, and then some women will take it and then discontinue because of the side effects. Um, so there's a high rate of non-compliance. In our study, we only included women who were compliant for that period of time. So it wasn't that they were, well, to the extent that they were filling their prescriptions. So they were still filling their prescriptions, which makes the assumption that they're filling it and using it. Yeah, it's a really hard one to, to monitor, I would assume, anyway. It's, it's like any of those um, peripheral components of a study. You're just hoping that you're capturing the data as accurately as possible. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Charles, I want to make sure I'm not going too far over time. Uh, do we do we have a few more minutes to ask a few more questions? Oh, yeah, let's, uh, Is that okay, Robbie, if we, we ask a few more? Robbie, it's, uh, Fantastic. Um, Thank you. Um, there was another, yeah, there was another question about depression, often seen as a prodromal risk marker for AD, uh, and itself has, um, so uh, major depressive disorder has a sex difference with regard to prevalence. Would you predict that similar approaches that are applied to research with major depressive disorder and associated cognitive impairment might net similar outcomes and perhaps offer a new treatment target uh, for major depressive disorder, for instance? So I, and, and I'm really thrilled that um, someone is asking that question because, you know, you're right that depressive disorder is a risk for Alzheimer's disease um, and depressive disorder is associated with decline in brain glucose metabolism. This was work done by Natalie Raskon um, years ago showing that and replicated. Um, 
one of the things that uh, I would love for someone to do, um, we're kind of backed up, um, would love for someone to actually do the same kind of study, which is look at the drugs that people are taking for depressive disorder and ask, what's the long-term impact on risk of neurodegenerative diseases? Um, so uh, I'm hoping there is one. I'm hoping that there are a couple of drugs that actually reduce the risk. Um, and then the question would become, I, I think another question uh, to ask is, well, are they improving glucose metabolism in the brain? What, what's their neural um, uh, impact on right. a systems level? Because what I will tell you is that I don't think targeting one, one drug to one receptor is actually going to be the answer for a systems biology aging issue, right? It's a systems biology problem. It's not a, for example, with epilepsy. I know there is a very clear relationship between epilepsy and dysregulation of the GABA chloride channel complex, which is fixable with a very targeted therapeutic. Alzheimer's is not like that. It's a systems biology disease. Absolutely, and that's very so well for, said. So look for drugs that are, have a lot of off-target effects. Mm. Yep. Well, well, we'll get on that. So hopefully the crew is, is starting to crack the data now as we speak. Uh, another question is about, um, are you looking at all at the effects of static estrogen levels versus cycling um, cyclical estrogen levels in, in hormone therapy? And also how does progesterone factor in? Yeah. So we did this study a number of years ago. And um, so it, first of all, clinically, I think it's a very important question because um, for compliance reasons, the use of continuous combined hormone therapy, whether that's oral or transdermal, is the norm. Um, and that's not the normal biological uh, cycle uh, for um, exposure for uh, steroid hormones. Um, so it's a good question. And then the, the, when we did this basic science study, what we found was when we took um, overectomized animals, they were you know, kind of older, but still cycling, um, about eight months of age, and we overectomized them and then replaced them with estrogen um, and then cycled progesterone and then continuous combined or OVEX alone, you know, with the vehicle. And what we found is that estrogen with cyclical progesterone restored or prevented the, um, you know, decline in brain glucose and mitochondrial function. When we had it combined, though, it looked worse than the OVEX because it suppressed the compensatory responses that were on trying, were being activated in the ovexed animals and the overectomized animals. So I'm very concerned about continuous combined therapies. Um, it's just from my basic science data. So we, we really need to look at that. And again, that really takes huge numbers of uh, data sets, huge numbers within a data set. Right, right. It is hard to to piece that, uh, uh, pull yeah. that apart. I remember, um, I believe, in the featured research symposium a few years ago when you spoke. Uh, I think it was um, within that same session. Walter Roca had said, um, "You know, we're giving you know women the same thing, but every single woman is a is a different uh, makeup, um, yeah. you know, of of um, of chemistry." So you know, it's it's kind of an interesting question. Just uh, the, the idea of giving a, a, the same formulaic um, dose and, and then how you cycle it. Um, the other, and then, I'm sorry, the other, I think, critical question that's not being addressed um, is, you know, the compounding pharmacy formulations. Um, the compounding for pharmacy formulations are not regulated. Um, and every woman now in hormone therapy is you know, her own experiment, and especially so in compounding pharmacies. Um, I think they, they, they have a particular um, risk associated with them. You know, maybe 80% are fine, 20% um, are, are, are not. 
I just don't know. And no one knows mm, because yeah. every formulation is quite different and every manufacturer is quite different and none of those are quality controlled. And so that in and of itself would be a really fascinating study. Um, that's really interesting. I didn't know about that. Um, one question as well about, um, this is quite an interesting one. If you've missed the perimenopausal window for hormone treatment, is there anything one can do? So what I tell women is if they say they're having hot flashes, I'm always thrilled because that means their brain hasn't switched. And um, so if you're having hot flashes, yay. <laughs> um, and uh, your brain is likely still responsive uh, to estrogen. Um, the, you know, are, are there other things that women can do? And, you know, so that's, we are developing a um, natural source formulation. Uh, one of the things that women are concerned about is some of the safety risks with hormone therapy. And so we developed a, a formulation we call phytoserms um, to activate estrogen receptor beta, um, which is inhibitory of proliferation in breast and uterus, but acts like an estrogen agonist, uh, full estrogen agonist in brain to the extent that we can uh, tell. Uh, and that's been, uh, we've replicated that many times. So that's one possibility. But coming back to the original question is, if you're, if you're um, um, symptomatic, uh, particularly in cognitive uh, aspects, uh, and this is a clinical question, and there are lots of clinicians on the, on the uh, video conference here, which I'm really excited about. You know, I honestly don't know. I mean, obviously keeping glucose metabolism, uh, and I go back to the elite study, it, these women um, were, uh, all of the women that we analyzed were on placebo. Um, and um, so there were a group of women, the healthy metabolic women, who were asymptomatic, and all of their metabolic features were well and within well, were well controlled um, and had statistically significantly better um, um, cognitive function. Regrettably, in the elite trial, it wasn't possible to then ask this of the, um, of the hormone treated individuals because uh, there was no effect there. But overall, uh, keeping metabolic health is absolutely critical. Now, that said, I don't think it's a good idea for women past 50 to be rail thin. It's not our biology. That was our biology in the 20s, when we were 20, you know, in our teens, in our 20s, our 30s. And then that biology changed. And I do think that um, some peripheral lipids is actually a good thing. It's your energy pack you'll use in the future. That's a really good, really good way to put it. There was actually one final point, which I think was a really good one um, about the ketogenic diets and things like that in the context of um, what was uh, quote unquote, your amazing work. And I agree. Um, might this uh, suggest a chronic ketogenic diet could be harmful to the brain? Yeah. And, you know, and again, uh, this is area I think that's critical for um, a critical issue for research. So when, Ketone diets work effectively is, is when it's short duration. And essentially what that really means is that peripheral lipids are being utilized because you're not feeding yourself glucose. Right? That's, the, that's, that's the goal is go to those peripheral lipids and utilize that as a fuel. Now, obviously doing that for a long time um, is, is, I think, hazardous. Where ketogenic diets have worked fairly well is when people have excess weight that is, you know, not healthy. Um, then the ketogenic diet can be quite effective over the short term. In the long term, it is likely to have deleterious effects. The other time that it works well is in male athletes. Male athletes, you know, younger male athletes, will often use a ketogenic diet um, with great advantage. I don't think that's the case for women. 
Now, again, that's anecdotal. I don't have data to support that. Um, but I do think that it's a critical area because as everyone I think knows, the ketogenic diet has been proposed as a, you know, Alzheimer's therapeutic intervention with minimal statistical significant effects, minimal. And yet some people swear by it. Well, who are you? You know, what are you? And, um, and I think, again, what we really need is to bring the precision medicine approach to both our discovery science uh, and our clinical science. Uh, and it takes large numbers, but there are folks like Ray Chang in our group who are working on strategies that can identify, inter identify populations that are appropriate for an intervention um, he's been working on this in Alzheimer's disease using small numbers, like ADNI size numbers. Um, so I, I think this is within reach again. Um, but I think part of what would be very exciting is, you know, the clinical observations that, you know, this person had these kinds of characteristics on this nutritional intervention, whereas the same nutritional intervention had these other effects. I think the clinicians are leading, the clinicians have been doing precision personalized medicine since Hippocrates, right? What it hasn't been done is kind of effectively communicating that to the research population. I, mean, I remember when I was giving talks to physicians and they would constantly ask me about what about my women who are taking, you know, isoflavones or soy extracts? And I would come back and I would say to the lab, I'd have to say, I don't know, and come back to the lab and say, um, you know, we got to do this. And after about five years of pounding on the bench and saying we have to do this, we actually did it. Um, so what clinicians observe, the, the types of questions that clinicians have um, can be very inspiring. I mean, I'm in Alzheimer's because of a clinician um, and uh, can be very inspiring and fascinating for um, scientists to investigate. That's beautifully put. And I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of questions here and, and a lot of data that needs to be either gathered or just put together um, to tackle these questions, mm -hmm. particularly at a large scale now that we have so much data available, open source and clinical trials, if we can get that access to those, mm -hmm. um, those data. So I'd like to, on behalf of everybody um, on the call, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk, really inspiring, really exciting. And, um, and I'm really excited again, as everybody has said for you to come and actually visit us in person, have dinner with us, um, talk more about science and fun stuff. And, uh, and yes, and with that, I think I'll, I'll close the session. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun and wonderful to see wonderful friends and new friends um, and look forward to seeing you in person. Great. Thank you so much. And just uh, at my uh, words to Rachel's, thank you again, Robbie. Terrific talk. Thank you, Rachel, for moderating and uh, a big round of virtual applause for Robbie. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Stay well, everybody. Thanks. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.